again, with prior domain knowledge, it's a level of experience that a learner has in what you're trying to teach them. Uh, this is a picture of Walter White and Jesse Pinkman from Breaking Bad. Um, they're both chemists of a sort, but if you were teaching chemistry to Walter, who's an expert, he's a genius, he's a chemistry teacher, you'd approach it very differently than if you were teaching it to Jesse, who failed high school chemistry and is um, kind of a <laughs> loser in general. Um, but if you tried to teach the information to both of them in the same class, one of them wouldn't be getting the benefit they needed from it. So by using an e-learning platform, you can actually accommodate both of these types of learners at the same time. Again, spatial ability is just how a learner can understand different spatial relationships on the screen. Um, the way this relates to e-learning is more about UI design. You just want to design a UI system that's intuitive and doesn't take too much effort on this part of the learner to figure out how it works. Again, metacognition is how people evaluate their own learning process. And studies have shown that people with high metacognitive abilities understand and retain information much better than people with lower abilities in this area. Um, this is something you can do as an instructor or as an e-learning platform. Uh, you can support these abilities. You can train people on how to access these abilities. And you can also prompt them more interactively with dynamic quizzes and self-review. The cognitive load uh, is pretty intuitive for most people. It's just you have a finite amount of information you can process at once in your brain. Um, there's a theory that your brain can only hold seven pieces of information in short-term memory at a time. Uh, the metaphor of computer RAM and a highway holds pretty well because in computer RAM you have a given amount of megabytes or gigabytes that you can deal with. If you want to put in new information, you've got to get rid of some old information. So you've got to make sure that a learner's new information you're giving a learner is retained before you move on to something else. Otherwise, it's just lost in, in this wave of new information. Systems learning is the time it takes a learner to learn a new model of interaction. So with traditional education, like in high school, students are pretty comfortable with how learning works. They don't have to figure out, you know, maybe in junior high school to figure out, I'm going to sit in a desk, I'm going to go from class to class, I'm going to listen to the teacher, I'm going to do some homework, and that's taken as a given. But when you're using an e-learning platform, they have to figure out how do I use the software, how do I log in, how do I interact with the information coming at me. Um, a good illustration of this is social platforms. So this is the original Facebook layout when it rolled out into colleges in the um, mid-2000s. You had your profile picture, your friends, your information. People figured out how to use it, and they started using it. But then the layout updated and people had to relearn how to use the software. So they still had the same objective. They wanted to upload the pictures. They wanted to make new Facebook friends. But before they could do any of that, they had to figure out how to use the software again. And this is how it looks now. Again, a whole other iteration of systems learning had to take place before people could do what they want. And then on another level, we have Google+, Plus, which is similar to Facebook, but has different paradigms about how you make friends, how you share your information with your friends. Um, so with e-learning, you just want to figure out how to reduce the systems learning as much as possible. So how can we use these theories to support all these different types of learners? Every student's an individual. They're going to have a different, they're going to exist on a different part of the spectrum in each of these um, areas. So um, some ways that we've identified we can support individual learners are to make profiles of the learners to identify where they're at in all these areas, separate the navigation and the learning tasks so we can focus on the learning task. Um, we generalize the learners into linear and nonlinear learners um, for purposes of figuring out how to deliver information. Because it's a nonlinear environment, we can adapt to prior domain knowledge um, dynamically. We want to reduce the cognitive load. We also want to dual code the information, and I'll talk about that later. And then in terms of um, continued learning after a student receives information, we use Bloom's Taxonomy to create exercises um, in order to augment the game development training. So for student profiles, 
Uh, the three areas that we found were most important in figuring out how a student learns are their field dependence, their prior domain knowledge, and their spatial ability. So if we can evaluate an individual student online in each of these three areas, we can figure out how we're going to deliver information to them. Um, with the navigation and learning tasks, these are two things that a student has to do simultaneously when they're approaching an interactive learning environment. And because of that, the navigation task could get in the way of the learning tasks. So we wanted to have a low cognitive load, and the way we found to do that was to use existing modes wherever possible. So rather than introduce something new to the student, we want to use navigation models they're familiar with, teaching models they're familiar with, and even software they're familiar with uh, wherever possible. And this can be something as simple as using the search bar. People who use the internet know how to use search bars. If there's a layout like YouTube or Facebook that serves what you're trying to do, use that layout and the student won't have to spend time learning it. Or even just putting the login button at the top right of the screen instead of hiding it somewhere in a sidebar or at the bottom of the screen. So the two groups of learners that we were able to divide people into were linear and nonlinear learners. Uh, the internet is inherently nonlinear, so it offers up a lot of really great opportunities for nonlinear learners. But we also can accommodate linear learners at the same time um, by doing interactive dynamic adaptation on the back end. Uh, linear learners are going to be field dependent, so they're going to want to know where they exist in the learning process. And we need to give them simple and direct navigation cues because they want to know the information that's coming at them, and then they just want to know where to go next. They don't want to spend time figuring out where to go next. For nonlinear learners, they're probably field independent. They might also be field dependent learners that have high prior domain knowledge or spatial ability. So they might be field dependent, but based on their level of experience, they might benefit from some kind of nonlinear interaction with the information. Um, and nonlinear learners also need some kind of organization um, or some kind of way to evaluate this nonlinear information. If it's just out there in this giant cloud, that's not really helpful. They need to be able to see um, that what they're looking for is relevant to them. So um, annotated links is a way to achieve that, where you can, you can have a link to a new module of information and the student can just evaluate on the spot whether or not it's going to serve um, what they're trying to learn at that given moment in time. Uh, so for nonlinear learners, this presenting discrete learning units is important um, so we can separate these, these pieces of information and give them to someone in a nonlinear way. So we've modularized lessons and also project files and the way instructors deliver information so someone could jump into a piece of information or a lesson, not be lost, and still have it be useful to that student. We also want to provide reference material, which is similar to a modular lesson, but it's not meant to instruct people. It's more of a refresher or just the way you would use an encyclopedia or a dictionary. Also, using contextual linking is helpful to nonlinear learners. Um, we can suggest where they go next without explicitly telling them, and we can also um, give them the ability to evaluate that new information before they start to ingest it. And then we want to encourage metacognition. It's more helpful for nonlinear learners. It's another level of learning that is likely to disorient a more linear learner, but it's extremely helpful for people who want to learn this nonlinear way. And for linear learners, um, I know I'm covering some of this um, twice a little bit, but this is this is just such an interesting part of, of online education because you have all these just great opportunities to, to shape the learning process for individual people. Um, so I think it's really important to understand this and go over it thoroughly. Um, so for linear lear learners, uh, you want to give external direction. Um, one way to do this would be to create a visual map of your learning track so they can clearly see here's where I'm at and here's where I've been and here's where I'm going. Um, you want to give obvious cues for passive navigation. Learners don't want to think about where they're going, they just want to go. So nice big previous and next buttons is one way to achieve that. Uh, you can also adapt your navigation options to different learners. 
So you can have a UI that's different for learners based on their field dependence. Um, and then again, reduce systems learning and don't alienate learners with low spatial ability by just exercising effective UI design. Um, also adapt to prior domain knowledge, uh, easy in a nonlinear environment. You can deliver advanced material to advanced students, beginning material to beginning students, and you don't have to worry about accommodating everyone at the same time and just painting with this really broad brush. Um, to reduce cognitive load, uh, some this is a pretty intuitive concept for instructors. Cover one point at a time. Make sure you build a foundation of knowledge first, and then you can expand on it later. Um, one process we like to integrate into our videos is to introduce the material, then you cover the material, then you summarize the material, and then you perform exercises to increase recall later. Um, so the next concept is dual coding theory. The dual coding theory is the theory that you get information on two different channels, the visual channel and a verbal channel. And they're processed in parallel. And not only are they processed in parallel, but you actually understand information better if you get the information on both channels at the same time. So to illustrate that, if I give you the information ver uh, verbally like I did before, it might have not stuck quite as well as now when I have this visual information in front of you. And I tell you that the dual coding theory is the theory that verbal and visual information are processed along two distinct channels. So the way to solve this, the way to accommodate this, is to just make sure you have something visual as you are instructing verbally. Um, an extension of this is the multiple code theory, which is that you have the verbal and the nonverbal spaces, but you also have a symbolic and a sub-symbolic domain in each of these. Um, basically, not completely, the symbolic domain is what you're presenting, and the sub-symbolic domain is how you're presenting and what that means to the individual and their own experiences or their own cultural background. So um, in the verbal domain, the sub-symbolic part of that is the inflection of the words, the rhythm of the words, the emotion. You can imagine getting a lesson from Ben Stein versus Jim Cramer. Um, ben Stein has this slow, monotonous drone. Jim Cramer has this manic... Um, delivery and people are going to be affected differently based on on who this is. One may work better for some, one may work better for others, but it's important to realize that that's a factor. Um, with nonverbal information, the sub-symbolic stuff um, is also, it's individual, it's cultural. This is a swastika, it's a Hindu symbol, um, but the Nazis appropriated it, flipped it around, and now for most of us it has a much stronger correlation with that part of history than it does with Hinduism. So if you were teaching something about Hinduism, this would be distracting. Um, you would have to address the cultural appropriation of it by the Nazis, and that would affect how you're, what you're, um, you know, if you're teaching a world religion class, this might not be the best image to use when you're teaching about Hinduism, um, just because it, it might detract from from what you're actually trying to get across. Now Bloom's taxonomy should be familiar to a lot of educators. It's a way to structure exercises to maximize understanding and recall of new information. Um, there are a few spaces. There's a cognitive space, psychomotor space, and also um, an emotional space. Um, for the purpose of game development training, both the cognitive um, seem most applicable. Um, game development's an interesting subject because it actually integrates both of them. Um, it's really creative, it's also really technical, but every aspect of the game development process can benefit from um, both of these technical and creative sides. So the cognitive space of Bloom's taxonomy has these steps, um, and these are just some examples of what exercises might look like that address each of these steps. So if you go through a lesson, a video or an interactive lesson, um, just remembering, listing the points of the main lesson, um, that's the first step, just to realize what happened. Uh, understanding is the next step. That might be writing a detailed description, something a little more in-depth. Applying the knowledge can be something as simple as categorizing the topics or 
illustrating them visually or connecting them. And analyzing is where they really start to think critically about the information and say, what did I learn? How can I apply it to what I'm trying to do? What was intended by the instructor for me to learn? Uh, evaluation, more critical thinking, not just what did I learn, but what have other people said about the subject? What do I think about the subject? And how does that affect what I'm trying to do with this information? And then finally, the creation or synthesis step is to apply that knowledge to something practical, to actually create something that applies this knowledge. So if you're teaching a course on level design, then the evaluation step might be uh, maybe the instructor has some theories about pacing. And if you skip the evaluation step, the student may take the professor's theories as law and might miss out on some important critical thinking on their own. They might not apply their own opinions and interpretation of the information to their work. They might just stick with this, this one narrow point of view. Um, psychomotor space is mostly for machine learning. It's how someone learns a task. So with software training, it's most applicable because there's not a lot of room for creative interpretation when you're figuring out how to use the undo button or how to create a simple sphere in Maya. So this is just a way to understand um, or a way to better comprehend those skills and perfect them. And uh, I'm not going to go over this, but these slides will be available later if anyone wants. Um, pretty straightforward. So for game development training, we kind of have to use a hybrid of both of these. Um, again, psychomotor space is mostly for software tools. Cognitive space is mostly for theory and design concepts. But some software tools have paradigms that are a little more abstract that might benefit from cognitive cognitive space exercises. So um, on the topic of integrating e-learning, so these are all really interesting topics about education, I think, and um, integrating them into your classroom is its own challenge. Um, the, we work with a bunch of universities uh, we're in 50 or 60 game design programs. And after talking to all those professors, these are some of the things of value that they've found in integrating an e-learning platform into their classroom and their curricula. Um, by using e-learning, just go here, you can defer your tools teaching. So you don't have to spend time in class teaching a software tool. You can use that time for um, instructor discussion. You have the expertise of a professor or um, an experienced designer or animator, and it doesn't make sense to waste their talent on teaching how to use the tool when a video or an interactive lesson do that for you. You can use that time to take advantage of the fact that you have all these students together in one room with an expert instructor. You can do group projects, you can do kinesthetic learning, you can also do multidisciplinary projects with other departments, um, which also develops soft skills. So say they're an engineer, but by working with musicians and artists, they can figure out, you know, they learn a little bit about music, they learn a little bit about art, and they also learn how to deal with musicians and artists, and then how to integrate that stuff into their own projects. Um, supporting field independent learners is, I mean, this is the part that excites me the most about online education, because in traditional education, it's really hard to accommodate this kind of learner because you have everyone in the same room, you have one trajectory of learning, and there's just not a way to give individual attention to everyone. But because the internet is inherently nonlinear, it opens up all these crazy opportunities for supporting everyone. And you can still accommodate linear learners, but you also open up all the stuff for nonlinear learners. And currently, traditional education doesn't utilize the internet. I mean, it's a really culturally ingrained technology, um, but education isn't taking advantage of it as, as fully as it could. Um, an online e-learning platform could also offer certification in software. There's an incentive for students in your program. Um, it could also differentiate you from other secondary or post-secondary programs. Um, there's also money available 
to programs that offer certification, um, financial aid and funding. And there's also, um, let's see, move on real quick here. Um, so an online platform can also be a partner in your teaching. So it, it supports your students, but it also supports you as an instructor. Uh, by having shared resources, sorry. <laughs> skip that bullet point real quick. Um, having the materials on demand is part of supporting individual learners. So you can have a student learn at their own pace, learn what they're interested in learning, um, and, and take that out of the classroom. And as an instructor, you can trust that an organization that, that puts on the, or that develops a platform and delivers the content has done the research to identify what's most important, what needs to be learned, and that's just a burden that's lifted from you as an instructor. Also, the train the trainer concept applies that if you're an engineering teacher, for example, who hasn't done game development, you can bone up on these tools and stay ahead of your students, even if it's not something that you're super familiar with. Um, E-learning platform also can help smooth out some bureaucratic issues that educators are educators are often faced with. Um, because tools keep coming out and because software keeps updating, content, educational content is really prone to getting out of date quickly. And the approval process in secondary and post-secondary schools is excruciating. It takes a long time to get sign off on a new textbook. Um, but by adopting a platform and the platforms approve, then on the back end, the content that's, that's updated um, is sort of grandfathered in. It's, it's automatically accepted. And if you trust the source, you get these content updates um, that keep your educational material up to date, whereas working with a traditional textbook might not provide that luxury. So the state of e-learning right now, um, if you want to learn more about all this stuff. The British Journal of Educational Technology is a fantastic publication that does a lot of research into how people learn and how technology can augment and affect the way that people learn. Again, lynda.com is um, the big fish of e-learning right now. They have a wide array of video tutorials that are modularized which support um, field independent learners. Um, Design 3, we're game development and art focused. We also have video tutorials that are modularized, but we've um, done a lot of work to augment the learning process beyond just presenting video information. Um, we've created contextual and annotated links for nonlinear learners to be able to evaluate and access new information. We also have these instructor directed long form projects, entire game builds, entire modeling animating, rigging, texturing, um, art projects for linear learners. We have a community which um, aids in social learning, which is another aspect of, of education. Uh, we also have instructor support, um, existing curriculum, syllabi, and exercises for instructors to use, a media arm with game developer interviews, event coverage articles. Um, looking forward, we're going to implement some reference videos, some more metacognition support, some dynamic navigation models to support um, or to, to further accommodate the individual differences among learners. And then there's software like Code Academy, which um, for those who aren't familiar, Code Academy teaches you how to program using JavaScript. And it's actually a, a little miniature code editor. It tells you what to type, you type it, it tells you if you did it right or wrong, and then you move on once you've learned that, that bit of information. And having that live feedback loop is extremely effective. I mean, I think this is really the pinnacle of what e-learning can be, but its limitation is that it's such a narrow focus. It really only applies to that one discipline, and each discipline is so unique that the system would have to be redesigned for every new discipline, every new topic. So I, I think the um, future of e-learning is going there, but it's going to take an incredible amount of resources to, to realize that. Um, so that was this presentation on um, on e-learning and supporting diverse learners. My name is Dan. Again, I'm the instructor 
instructional designer for Design3. If you want to get in contact, email me at dan at design3.com. And if you want um, some more of the research that went into this, I can, I can give you some of the papers. I can also give you these slides. So uh, thanks again for listening. And if anyone had any questions, um, I think we're taking those now. That's great. Thanks a lot, Dan. Uh, so anybody who's got any questions, just uh, post them into the little chat panel and we'll be able to see them there. Anybody at all? So, okay, I mean, you're talking about things like Code Academy. Um, so, I mean, is that where you think everything is going to go? Is everything going to go to towards things like that? And um, sort of the, uh, the is it Stanford that are running classes? Online classes? Yeah, the, the online sort of degree program thing. I'm not I'm sure. Not sure. Uh, I mean, I know, I know places, places like, like ITV, ITV. And kind of kind of into into lots of, of um, online, online lectures, lectures, but it's, it's not, not. I mean, it's, it's, it's still, still one-sided one -sided delivery of information. information. It's right. not really interact like like coding anime. Um, I, I, I do think, think though. I mean, being put academy, academy is just such a great, great implementation of interact learning. learning. Um, but it takes so, so much work to make that happen. happen. Uh, and and, and you know. Federally, Federally, education funding is my priority. It's really, really research, research and development effort on behalf of um, either the government or the private sector. If people are investing in educational technology, then there's opportunity there. But um, you know, for now, the what we're trying to do with this hybridization of, of video learning is um, just more realistic for the time being, and it, it integrates more easily into you know, existing educational models than something like Code Academy might. Cool. Thanks, Dan. Um, anybody have any more questions? So Mark asks, uh, Mark is trying to persuade his colleagues uh, sorry, his college to provide video training for learners at home so that they can concentrate on projects in the classroom. Um, sure. Is there any data that shows the benefits of this? Um, I'm trying to think of any, I don't think there is research that I'm aware of about like video learning versus classroom learning. Um, there's a lot of research about all these topics that I discussed um, being applied to learning that one could apply in a classroom or through a video platform, although um, the, the benefit of a video platform is really to be able to apply these to an individual student rather than to 30 or 100 students at the same time. Um, we do have feedback from instructors who are using our material, material for example, um, and they have a lot of positive feedback about um, mostly the way they're able to use their own class time and the way that they're able to integrate new programs. Um, a lot of people are just starting up game design. It's kind of a new uh, venture for a lot of educators. So having an established curriculum that um, schools are using is, is valuable to them. Um, I can look into that though and see if there's some, some concrete video learning versus non-video learning research, if that's interesting to him. Cool. Um, next question from Adrian uh, is, you spoke about the effectiveness of the feedback loop for learning. How do you go about offering a feedback loop on design3.com? On design3.com, um, well, it's video mostly, so the kind of um, extremely live feedback loop uh, is hard to implement. Um, for us, it's more in the form of blended learning. Um, instructor support helps with that. So if you're if you're guiding 
the learning on your own, but also working with an instructor uh, once or twice a week, they can evaluate where you're at and, and help you with that. Uh, the exercises that we offer also help engage the student um, with the information. So you're not able, if you're teaching how to use Maya, you can't tell if the, if the learner's you know, using the extrude tool or not. You just have to trust that they are. Um, but by offering exercises for the student to perform, you can at least say, if you go through these exercises, um, then you know we're confident that you've understood the material, you've remembered the material, you've thought critically about the material, and then um, by by projecting that into practical projects like um, you know the portfolio models and animations. Um, an instructor can evaluate those exercises and those projects and and see if a student has effectively learned something or not and then guide them back to videos if they think the student need, still needs to learn something. Oops, I had my microphone mic uh, muted. Um, okay, here's a, a new question. Uh, have you looked at using game techniques and technology instructionally? Uh, that's from Mark Flanagan. Uh, what, what techniques? Uh, game techniques and technology. Oh, using games as instruction? Seems to be the question, yeah. Yeah. Um, not thoroughly. Um, it's definitely effective, I, I think, from what I've read. I mean, there's a lot of serious game developers out there. Uh, I know the Army especially has a, it's a huge serious games market that uses those for training. Um, game, game training via games is definitely interesting. Um, and that, that kind of approaches more of the uh, Code Academy model where you're able to, to see exactly what the student's doing guide them accordingly. So um, I, th I think it's really interesting, but uh, just that, that type of, of educational model is so specific and takes such an investment to create that it's hard to implement. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's cool. I think it's interesting. I think it's valuable, um, but it's, it's just so narrow.